We are on the precipice of an historically high nuclear risk. Ukraine is being devastated and it's suffering. Putin seems out of control. We've got to understand him and manage him better, but that might not stop him. So what about the possibility of getting rid of him? Could there be a coup against Vladimir Putin? Who could do it? What would it look like? Would we want that? We're going to explore all of this coming up. To get answers to these questions, we've got to understand Putin's power. And to understand Putin's power, we've got to understand how the Putin regime has changed over recent years. Because the regime, contrary to what you might think, is not a monolith with Putin simply sitting at the top. Over several years, Putin was losing power. We've repeated this on this channel, that Putin ended up refereeing rather than leading many of the conflicts in the clans around him. And what's the evidence for this? Well, there can't be evidence for this as such in the regime that is so amorphous and so fluid. But it's about looking at the organism as a whole and seeing how it evolves. I am not the only one who believes this. There are many others. One of them is Gleb Pavlovsky, one of the architects of early Putinism who jumped off the boat, but maybe not soon enough. Here is Pavlovsky. We don't that it's not Putin who runs the country. Putin delegates маленькой группе людей президентские полномочия. Это не шутка. Это, между прочим, тоже должностное преступление. Ну, оно может быть уголовное, может быть, нет, я не знаю, не готов сказать. А эти люди дальше делают с ними, что хотят. Они их продают, они ими торгуют. Вот эти люди в окружении Путина – продавцы президентских полномочий. This picture is no longer quite true, because Putin has used the war to grasp back power for himself. And so it's not just that the war has reshaped the dynamics of the Kremlin, it's that the war was partly made to reshape the dynamics in the Kremlin. But this has created a problem for Putin, because now that he is more central and he's making all of the decisions, he's potentially more more vulnerable because at some point after the war, perhaps after a humiliating war, he's going to have to give this power back to the elites around him. Putin has alternatives. One alternative is to keep escalating on the international stage, keeping power centered in his hands. The other alternative is to increasingly instigate repression and terror at home. And so escalation abroad is something that's part of the logic of Putin's position now, independently of Ukraine, as is potentially repression at home, because that is tied to him remaining powerful. Putin didn't just do a power reshuffle. He also went into an extraordinary ideological turn. Everybody has read about the 2020 illegal constitutional change he implemented, and that was rightly reported as a way for Putin to stay in power as long as he wants. But there was something deeper going on there. He was reformatting the nature of the Russian state in accordance with a new ideological vision, and we've got to talk about that. Putinism, historically, has been this remarkable and ill-assorted combination, that's why it's going to be studied for many years, of cynicism and idealism. The cynicism of a regime that operates like a mafioso uh, gang, but at the same time there are all of these big ideas about Russia's role in the world. And the cynicism and the idealism, or idealism in reverse as I call it, because it's a destructive kind of idealism, but the cynicism and the idealism in reverse have always gone hand in hand. But something happened in recent years, and that 2020 constitutional change is emblematic of this, and that's that the idealism has now, in a disturbing way, taken center stage. Like many Russian leaders before him, Putin succumbed to a visionary idea of Russia's historical destiny, as exemplified in the will of a single individual, Putin, whose mission it is to enact this historical destiny. And so this quasi-religious civilizational fervor has come to dominate the regime's goals. And in fact, 
even some of the instrumental goals of the regime are now becoming subservient to this larger vision. That's partly why Putin is happy to justify the calamitous impact of the sanctions, which he didn't fully expect, by saying, well, in the long line of history, these sanctions will be sort of milled over in a century from now, we'll have the benefits without the downsides. But it's the sanctions that we've now got to turn. The sanctions are, neutrally speaking, a retaliatory act of war. Putin invaded Ukraine, the West hit Putin back with a non-military act of war because the sanctions are a dismantling of Russia's political, economic and social infrastructure. They're going to have quite certainly two consequences to start with. One is that they're going to induce further international escalation in Putin because he's going to have to reply to the sanctions hit. And the second consequence is that as Russians get poorer and poorer, he's going to have to resort to more repression and terror. He's not going to be able to make sure all Russians are paid, but he will make sure that the small minority of Russians who are there to beat up the majority with the batons when they try to protest are paid. But do the sanctions make regime change or a coup more likely? Well, the sanctions and their disastrous consequences are a tool that could be used within the Russian elites to generate regime change. But is there anybody in the Russian elites who could do that? That's what we're going to look at now. Palace coups happen in countries run by palaces. Russia is a country that's run by a palace. So who is in that palace and what are they like and what are they up to? Can any group of people come for Putin and arrest him or bonk him over the head? This is an age-old problem for the courts of a king when the king has stepped over the bounds. So we've got to take a look at who is in that king's court, in that palace. There is the military, there are the ideological advisors, there are the agencies like the SVR and the FSB, there is the economic team, there are oligarchs who aren't really oligarchs, and then there is everybody's children. So let's break this down. As we look at the clans and groups one by one, we've now got some good news. And that's that for the first time, there is a unity that is available to at least many of these people against Putin. And the unity is that the war is a crazy thing and that the consequences of the war in their minds are an even crazier thing. And so there is finally something to potentially unite a lot of these people against Putin. Let's break this down. First, the oligarchs. The bad Bad news with the oligarchs is that there are no oligarchs in Russia because an oligarch is somebody who has got capital and political power. And Russia had extraordinarily important oligarchs in the 90s like Berezovsky or Kusinsky or Khodorkovsky. That's not there now. If you are spectacularly wealthy in Russia, overnight your money could just come to belong to the regime. So these are not folks with great political power. The good news though is that the preponderant majority of them think that what is happening is nutty and they've got kids who have a very western lifestyle and these kids think that's even more nutty than their parents do. The agencies are mixed. As we saw in the last video, the leader of the SVR was not impressed with the idea of a war but went along with it. So the SVR, you could say, the Foreign Intelligence Agency, is sort of soft on the idea of the whole war business. The FSB would be more pro-war, but would be cynical enough to know that there'd be so many counterproductive consequences. So the FSB is probably divided. The economic bloc is just not encouraged to say anything at all direct about politics. So they're just going to do their job, but the economic consequences are going to be cataclysmic for Russia, and they're aware of that. 
The military, exemplified by Defense Minister Shoigu and Gerasimov, the head of the army, they are on Putin's side. But if Putin continues to lose his share more and more and literally tries to start a nuclear war, they're probably going to stop him. But for one or more of these groups to make any kind of move, they've got to feel that Putin has lost the Russian people and leverage that in a tussle up there in the Kremlin. So where are the Russian people? Well, the Russian people are in a bad place. Just now, as we record this, they have, in a period of two weeks, lost much of their freedom. They went from living in a sort of media-driven authoritarian regime to living in a neo-totalitarian regime, which genuinely practices much more repression and terror than it did two weeks ago. Their lives radically changed, and that's why a good number of people escaped from the country. You've got to think about the Russian people in two ways. There is the 15% of the population or less that is ethically unhappy about what's happening. There's more people than that who are ethically unhappy, but this is really folks who are genuinely ethically unhappy about the war because Putin is b bombing their closest sibling and because they know what the sanctions are doing and gonna do to Russia. They're informed. So these are people who have primarily an immediate ethical objection to all of this. And then, of course, they're desperately economically worried too. The second group, let's call it 80, 85 percent, are people who have no ethical objection to what's happening. They haven't discovered yet the economic calamity that's going to face them, but they will. So we've got the ethical objectors who already see everything. And then we've got the economic, socioeconomic objectors who don't yet see everything, but will next week, the week after, and over the course of the next few months, and quite certainly by the middle and late summer. And then there is something that the two groups, the 15 and the 85 percent share, and that's an increasing sense of background fear that encourages them to be precautionary before raising their hand or taking a step forward. The 85% is going to further break down into two kinds of responses. One, a response of inappropriate normalization. And that's to say they're going to say, well, this is not as bad as it looks. This war is a military operation. The economic decline is just a few bumps. The repression is, well, who needs these newspapers and radio stations anyway? So they're going to try to make the situation look more benign than it is. And that's partly going to be fear driven. But the second branch of that 85% is going to go down the side of siding with what they perceive to be the stronger party. And that's the government. And they're going to be fearful and they're going to be angry. And they're going to express that fear even to loved ones that are going to be these sort of couch wars, which have already begun in Russia, where within families, relatives tell each other off for taking a stance against the government because, in part, they're just scared for their loved ones. So this is going to be fear-driven aggression and taking the side of the bully for self-protection. And then that first bunch is going to be to pretend that things are a bit more normal than they really are. Could somebody just take these Russians and lead them out onto the street? No. One of the Russian opposition figures who had to flee the country several years ago, Vyacheslav Maltsev, tried to do this and he thought there was going to be a revolution in November 2017 and nothing happened. A few small arrests and that's it. Alexei Navalny, the extraordinarily powerful opposition figure who is currently in jail, could do a lot better. But in the end, you can't lead the Russian people out until they shift quite a bit more. And that's the interesting paradox here, that when Putin was taking this obscurantist civilizational turn and planning to move Russia slowly toward a more repressive and terror-driven kind of uh, regime, he knew that having read where the population is, that he'd be allowed to go there. And so he went there a bit. And then he tested a bit where the people were. And he said, okay, well, this is fine. And he went there a bit more. So it's really important to acknowledge that once a 
terror regime is in place, it's very difficult for people to do anything about it. But at the same time, the way these regimes arise can't just be thought of in terms of top down. Putin, paradoxically, despite depriving his people of freedom, actually has a very good sense for what they're feeling. So because Russians can't be taken out onto the streets en masse, the only way a transformation, a coup can be made is if discontent in the population is strategically exploited by war, warring factions, by wars within the Kremlin. That's the only way the change will happen. And if any of the groups we mentioned were to try to orchestrate this change, the aspiration of that change, and here is perhaps the pessimistic news we've got to meet with eyes wide open, the realistic aspiration of that change will not be democracy. It will simply be a previous situation from a couple of years ago when elites were not disadvantaged and robbed of their resources like they are today. So it's going to be an elite transformation if it happens. And that elite transformation is going to address the needs of the elites to find themselves in a better place than where they currently are. So that's not turning back time to the 90s when Russia was a democracy. It's turning back time to before Putin's disastrous misadventures in Ukraine. The best guess of what will happen is that either Putin will become progressively more vulnerable over the next year or two and be shifted, or that he will manage to consolidate power. So if he survives in the short term, he is likely to be there health allowing in 10, in 15 years. So we're going to have to see what happens. The longer he stays in power, the more likely he is to start or provoke a nuclear war. And to understand the significance of that risk and how it affects us, watch this video.